everyone. Thank you very much. A warm welcome back to part two of our session today. We've got two great panels which will be happening over these next couple of hours to take us up towards lunchtime. We, as ever, would really appreciate it if you can have a think about any questions that you might like to ask the panelists. And either raise your hand as we go through the session, or you can also put them into the event app. Just go to the agenda and you can then press the discuss icon and enter your questions there. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome our next panelist to the stage for the next panel, who will be ably chaired by Rick Applefair. Hi Rick, great to see you. Thank you very much for joining us and I'll let you introduce the rest of the panelists from here. Thank you. Actually, it's Rick Kugelbeis. I know it's quite <laughs> difficult for um, the audience here. Um, I'm the founder, managing director of a banking scene, a network organization, mainly in Benelux, uh, for the banking community. During the pandemic, I started organizing virtual roundtable sessions, the banking scene afterward, every single week, and that taught me one very important thing, and that is that I really, really, really like to ask questions. Um, that's also why I'm very glad to be here today. And that's why I'm very glad to be here with four panelists. Unfortunately, one um, declined this morning um, because of personal reasons. But I'm very happy to have these four people here to talk about new, pay new methods of payments. We are very close to retail payments, but who are we leaving behind? That means that there are three elements to discuss the new methods of payments, we have the element of real-time payments and how it's evolving even across the globe, and perhaps also looking a little bit at financial inclusion and also exclusion. Our panel consists of Tom Greenwood, he's the CEO of Volt, uh, founder and CEO. It's a technology, a, the company is a technology developer, product innovator with a focus on new generation real-time payments infrastructure and open banking. Then we have Ian McDougall, if I'm pronouncing that well. Pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> uh, Chief Commercial Officer at Yapili, the second FinTech with, with a mission to enable businesses and consumers around the world to share data and access payment infrastructures. Rich Wagner, he is the founder and CEO of Cash Plus Bank um, until one year ago, I should have said a fintech. Now I can say a bank. Uh, it's a challenger SME bank. And then last but not least, Brioni Gregorian Slate. I hope I'm doing that well. Uh, <laughs> principal payments at UK Finance. Um, very warm welcome, everyone. I would like to raise my first question to Tom. Um, in our call, we were talking about real-time payments, and I learned that there are different interpretations. And as we learned in the opening keynote by um, Mr. Parker over there, it's all about perception. So let's get the perception straight to make sure that all of us are aligned when we talk about real-time real payments. How would you define real-time real -time payments? Thanks, Rick. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, good to meet you. Um, yeah, my name is Tom. I'm the CEO of a company called Vault. Uh, we've got a pretty senior team of um, payments industry people that have come together um, to address uh, the new paradigm payments infrastructure, which is increasingly real time around the world. We identify it uh, in a couple of different frames, I suppose. You've got the underlying infrastructure, which is in the UK, parcel payments or SEPA or SEPA instant, which I would classify as the rails. And then you've got um, the client interface or the API connectivity um, that allows for connectivity to those real-time rails to initiate um, account for account payments um, increasingly in real time. Um, and so open banking uh, under the Payment Services Directive 2 in Europe uh, is how the legislators have um, addressed uh, or sought to address the, the real-time payments opportunity. Um, open banking, it's important to point out, is not a real-time proposition on a ubiquitous basis yet. Um, that we expect and anticipate that to come. Um, and around the world, uh, there are 58 countries rolling out their 
uh, version, if you like, of uh, what we call open banking in Europe, um, which in India is called the Unified Payment Interface, in Brazil is called PIX, in Australia is called the New Payments Platform, and Singapore is called PayNow, um, the Fed. And the US announced two weeks ago the launch of their pilots on FedNow, which is uh, scheduled for a full launch in 2023. Um, and despite the fact that these payment systems come by different names and in different guises, they are all what we uh, identify as open banking in Europe, um, which is really this concept of authorized third party access to a bank account such that you can circumvent the card scheme by way of a account based payment method. Um, which is operated from the bank account and is bank account to bank account. Um, the reality of uh, the card infrastructure that we've all used and enjoyed over the last um, period is that that technology was designed in 1955 and 56. The first charge card was launched by a US bank in 1966. It's fundamentally the same technology in 2022 as it was as it was designed in 1955. Um, it's, uh, we have chip and pin, we have some uh, updates and developments, but uh, the uh, underlying core infrastructure of what, what's known as the four corner model that, that underpins a card transaction is the same today as it was 70 years ago. So, um, Pretty solid technology. It is pretty solid technology, but it, it, it's also overdue an overhaul, I think. Mm. And uh, open banking represents what we think at Vault is a generation shift to a new real time payments architecture. Uh, I personally fundamentally believe that five years from now, real time is the only time that we'll see in payments. Um, I think uh, innovation in payments is um, overdue, and you know, open banking represents, in its various iterations or guises around the world, the next generation and a new paradigm of payment services where money moves um, as fast as information. And I think um, historically we've accepted that we need to wait three or four days to get our money from the scheme, or uh, it takes a couple of days to get money to Australia, just because that's the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that past performance uh, necessarily reflects what we see in the future. Um, you've also got what's happening in uh, Web3 and on the chain, and central bank digital currencies and so on, which are around the next corner, which are also gonna have something to say about real-time payments. Um, so it's a discussion for next year. It is probably. <laughs> But so, um, real-time payments, I hear a lot of open banking. Open banking, for definition, I think doesn't have to be real-time. It has to be account-to-account, account, clearly. But you have to mix it with instant payments. So to you, real-time payments is a combination of instant and account-to-account, account, correct? Yes. Yeah, so you've, you've got the rail, right? Yeah. Which is your faster payments in the UK and um, your, your SEPA in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's, if I can use an analogy. Oh, um, SEPA East. SEPA East, yep, yeah, that's, yeah. the, that's the train track uh, that, that, that sits on the ground that the payments will run across. Right. But then you need to be able to access that rail, yep. and accessing that rail is, I guess, the train station. Um, and that's yeah, the banking piece. Oh, of course, thank um, you. So, yeah. In that call, Rich, um, unfortunately, you ended a bit later, so you didn't hear his definition, and yeah. I asked you the same question. I came with a bit broader definition, also referring to the uh, card schemes. Um, what's your definition of, of real time in that perspective? Well, I, 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 you need a master or visa sponsor in this, so you don't hear about the card schemes. I, I do agree, I, and I always stated that I think MasterCard's uh, acquisition of uh, uh, VocalLink was probably a really um, one of the best strategic acquisitions because they knew cards uh, were the legacy, and I, uh, I, I use those dates also. I, I, you know, I have people talk about contactless as being a you know cool new technology, and if you look at the patent for RFID, it was done in the late '80s, early '90s. So it takes the card schemes quite some time to get going, but I, it's a whole ecosystem of uh, basically getting a payment from point A to point B. Mm. Uh, you know, almost instantaneously. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's card, whether it's mobile, whether it's point to point, whether it's even an account. You know, does it have to be an account? You know, can, you know, you, you look at uh, the, the the use cases of you know mobile payments without a bank account uh, are out there. You know, it's just the time based element. So there's there's a lot of um, you know opportunity there. But you know, I I go back to the old school and think about everybody. There there was an industry push for uh, basket payments and. Now everybody considers it ubiquitous. Um, 
you know, the amount of use cases out there, um, the, the incremental use cases to get money in a second versus getting money in a day or getting money in three days when old farts like me uh, knew about that. Uh, the incremental uh, use cases, at least in my view, uh, hasn't changed much. Uh, but certainly the perception of individuals' uh, view on payments, because certainly UK has been one of the leaders here, is you know if I don't get my payment in five minutes, you know I, I mean that's like legacy. I mean I, I can tell you that in our call center, uh, as a result of you know being on the rails. Um, you will see a direct correlation between the time the person pushes their button uh, to send a payment to someone, and if that person doesn't say that they've received it in three or four uh, minutes, and I say minutes because you've got the human interaction, but if that, if that transaction from your system doesn't happen in seconds, I get a, I get a phone call. Something's wrong. Uh, you know, I do feel bad, so I mean, I'm part of the banking ecosystem these days now, but I do feel sorry for banks. Uh, in, in a lot of respects, because they do get a lot of bad press around basically uh, operational resilience and downtime. Uh, but I, I go back to the time frame where sending a payment you know, over a three day period was fine. The system could be down for 24 hours and nobody really cared. The press wouldn't care, mm. uh, the public wouldn't care. Uh, but that, that perception has changed a lot. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's real time now here and, you know, we have to live with it because I, you know, I, I think our marketing uh, folks have kind of coined a really interesting term of demographic now. It's, it's, you know, generation X, generation Y, whether the Y or generation, it's generation now. If I, if I don't get it now, uh, there's definitely something wrong with the ecosystem mm. of real time payments. All right, thank you. Hey, I'd like to ask the input of the audience. Um, when you think about real-time payments, do you consider it more from the infrastructure point of view or the consumer perception point of view? Who would go for option A? First definition. Yeah. As, as an issuer, it's a big infrastructure commitment for the issuer. I, I see major benefit for the merchant because you know all the things we have talked about it, three day settlement and instant payment and all that. But when you think from the point of the issue, it's nothing but pain because it's an infrastructure equipment, uh, it's this holding information, it's this complying with SCA, complying with other regulations. So from the issue point of view, we see from the infrastructure point of view, it is a huge commitment and pain. Mm. All right, thank you. Here's another opinion. I think from the consumer point of view, because they're the ones that drive conversion. Yep. Um, as a consumer myself, uh, if I order online several different products and then choose to return several of them, I sometimes have to wait five to ten days to get my money back. Mm. Yep. Whereas that merchant demands my payment instantly, otherwise mm. I don't get the product. Yep. All right, well, thank you. Rick, on that, on that point, maybe I could chime in there because it, it was a point that I was going to make myself. I'm sorry. No, 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 please go ahead. I was uh, Ian McDougall, nice to meet you all. Um, uh, I work at a company called Yahoo, and, uh, you know, one of Europe's leading open banking platforms, so have a very vested interest, obviously, in the concept of account-to-account -account payments for all of the reasons that, you know, that Tom and, uh, and Richard have already touched upon. I think this is a really interesting point, though, that's being raised over here because we focus so much on the consumer experience, uh, as we should. Uh, however, there are many parties in this kind of, um, I guess, this chain of value exchange that occurs in the world of payments, and we should also not lose sight of the merchant. Uh, yeah, because one that, the other. The because of, be, because of the, right, because of the nature of the payment relationship that needs to yeah. exist between the two. We as consumers, many of us may not have a fundamental issue with cards today. They feel instant. We, we online or in a store, we purchase something with a card, and for all intents and purposes, we have paid. We have made an instant payment for that. Obviously, it's not the consumer's concern what happens downstream. Until to this gentleman's point, the concept of well, what happens with returns? What happens with refunds? Uh, what does that then mean for the consumer experience? And it's at that point that, as consumers, we start to think, well, why should we settle now for less than? both the benefit that the merchant gets of 
you know, the perception of already having our money, but not being able, you know, to get it back to it, back to us. If we look at that from the merchant's perspective as well, particularly in SMEs for whom, as we all know, you know, cash flow, reconciliation, management of refunds and returns and so forth is so important. It is undoubtable that instant is better than anything slower than that. And that has permeated all of our lives in terms of our expectations, as Rich has just said. We no longer accept anything less than instant in terms of moving information from one side of the world to the other. Yeah, exactly, and making sure that information also reaches destination all of, all of those 100% the same as the left, the other side right, of the world. Right, the integrity of it. So yeah. Why should we settle for less, knowing that the technology does exist, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. Tom's rattled off all of the examples of the, you know, the national real-time rails you know, in many countries around the world? Why should we accept mm -hmm. for anything less than instant, given that the technology exists to enable it? And that was going to be my first question to you, actually. Oh, well, well, there you go. I beat you to the punch. I'll just leave it aside. <laughs> there was some input from the audience out there. Actually, uh, Ian's made a lot of the points that I was looking to make. <laughs> <laughs> from the, but I think it is important to be very clear about what we mean by real time, what we mean by instant, and, and actually the consequences. I mean, like, like you said, what happens once it's gone? Can you get it back with, with, with a rail? Obviously, there's an issue with that at the moment. And, you know, also to back up what you said about SMEs and reconciliation. So our research would say exactly the same thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Brioni, new payment methods and real-time payments have to go hand-in-hand -hand in today's panel discussions, like here. But seriously, are we actually, is it something that we should talk about? Are we talking about innovation or are we talking about improvement of the existing payment rails? Is it true innovation or improvement of existing processes? Do you mean more new products on existing rails? Yeah. yeah. Like Do you see a lot more new products or is it simply an improvement of what exists years and years ago because these discussions have been going on for quite a while? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm going to take the conversation back a bit by talking about um, things like contactless and buy now, pay later. Just briefly to introduce um, UK Finance, so um, it's trade body for financial services, everything from capital markets through um, to commercial lending and payments. Uh, we have about 300 members and we deal with regulation, so PSD2, Clark Park Market Review projects, so we ran the strong customer authentication project for the UK, um, and then support leadership stuff on open banking and everyone here is a member or almost a member of UK Finance so that's you know a good, good part of the family. Um, yeah it, it's been really interesting discussion so far and I, I was just reflecting like cards essentially are a form of centralised payment because they have the card schemes running um, the, the show but put it politely um, whereas open banking at the moment is still a fairly decentralised method. So you have the open banking implementation entity um, trying to create a framework and governance structure for it, um, but essentially it's a bilateral piece at the moment, just like actually in the, the nascent days of the card world back in the 50s, it, you know, the reason the card schemes were created was to avoid that kind of bilateral discussion between issuers and acquirers and and merchants. So I think for us at UK Finance, we always have a few watch areas on any kind of evolving piece. I know I'm sort of getting ahead of the product discussion more to the rails discussion. Um, so like the resilience of the system, um, and if you have a slightly decentralized system, is that going to potentially have more resilience gaps, for example? Um, and we know, for example, the car schemes, you know, very well tested in terms of resilience although they do still fall over, as we did in 2018. Um, consumer, customer protections, I should say, so like the protections for the consumer and then also for the merchant. Um, again, in car schemes, you have like the enormous rule books um, <coughs> defining every single instance in which you would get your money back, either as a consumer or a merchant. Um, and then a lot of, um, well, capital holding behind that, actually, by acquirers, isn't there? So, at the moment, there's not that kind of equivalent in the open banking world, for example, or in other capital accounting world. Um, so that, yeah, the, resi the resilience and the, the consumer kind of 
protection piece on, on purchase risk, I guess. And then also, obviously, like the forward piece. And at the moment, there's a lot of discussion around is the, is the nature of real-time payments in itself allowing for an increase in fraud? So, for example, authorised push payment fraud, which is you know, booming in the UK, unfortunately. And we are, as UK Finance, trying to take several steps to address it. Um, but it's you know, a growing phenomenon. And one of the responses from regulators and Treasury has been, well, you know, should we decrease the real-time nature or extend the, the settlement period? Um, again, historically, cars have been, you know, the settlement has been a bit longer, and therefore, unlike cost payments, you perhaps don't have that, you know, that, that chance to intervene in a, in a fraudulent payment. Um, but I think our, our view is we need to put other protections in place. Mm -hmm. Don't don't stifle the innovation. Um, you know, just because there's a there's a glitch in the system, address the glitch and what's at, at the base of it, rather than slowing all the payments down. I don't think I'll you're, not, you're, you're, you're not alone in that. Um, yeah. Two days ago, I organized a conference in Brussels myself, but I was a panel on the sovereignty of Europe, next steps in retail payments. Mm -hmm. We had the CEO of the European Payments Initiative, someone of the European Commission, etc. Now, I didn't attend the entire panel, but one of the messages that I do remember was of uh, Eric Ducoulombier of the European Commission saying that real time or instant payments will be the future of um, the payments rails for consumers, in, um, whether it is true AP or not, remains to be seen. Um, that future is still rather uncertain, I'd say. But instant payments in combination with PSD2 should be the future. Now, I've worked at a bank before, uh, and I remember back in, I calculate back, I think 2014, I thought the end of banking is near. PSD2 is coming, fintechs are gonna take over, etc. Today we see there are more banks, and there is still PSD2, not that successful, <coughs> maybe more in the UK than in Europe. But why does it take so long to have real-time payments everywhere? Yeah? To this point, and what do we need yeah, of course. to make Look, it speed up, it make it a success in the very near future? To be maybe a, just very direct, I think it's a ridiculous proposition that banks will cease to exist and that you know, fintechs will take it's over. It's easy to say now, but well, back then. Well, I, I, I think it was a ridiculous proposition back then, to be very honest. I think it's the role. I was, a, that, I was a non bank and I was still saying banks are going to exist for another hundred years. years. <laughs> what, maybe I was just a bit naive. What, a, bank, what, a, bank, what do banks ultimately represent? For consumers and customers, they represent trust. Yeah. Ultimately, you can love them or you can hate them, but you have kind of confidence in them. The analogy that I always use is what happened in the telco industry back in the early 2000s, where telcos went from being strategic, to, you know, providers of content and so on, and we all know what happened. The internet came along, commoditized the telco industry, they became plumbers, and all of the over-the-top services you know, generated kind of the value and, you know, and, and won the day. The risk for banks is something similar happening, whereby they represent, ultimately at the end of the day, behind all of these payments sits money and bank accounts, and that's always going to be the case. Uh, the question is, what role do progressive thinking banks uh, enable themselves to play in capturing the value and all of those other things that relate to providing great services to merchants and consumers uh, in, you know, in and around the world. Of yeah, because an example of Telco, that's the reason back then why they said, of course. we only gonna have about four banks yeah. left per country, like with Telco. Yeah. We're now 15 years yeah. later and we see more yeah. banks. And the Telcos thought that their years. hold on the customer relationship would never go away. To some degree that's true, but it's mm. commoditized, right? And so that is, that is, you know, this is not new thinking. Yeah. I'm just restating it, I guess. That is, that is the risk you know, here for potentially for banks. But what we're seeing is the banking you know, institutions that get that are building amazing payment services, payments products, uh, propositions for, you know, particularly for their business customers, but also consumers. And they are going to be the ones that win the day, that continue to do the very basic thing of serving their customers well with valuable services rather than just holding on to those customers because they've always had them and, and, and had them locked up. And that is actually, at the end of the day, what open banking is enabling. That's why the CMA conceived of 
you know, the anti-competitive mandate in the first place, to open it up, enable that in innovation, and to kind of, you know, raise the tide for everybody. Uh, and, you know, we're still early in that journey for sure, but we're, we're seeing, you know, five million UK, you know, consumers making use of open banking services uh, and growing at, you know, an, an amazing rate. So there's no doubt that it's happening. All right, thank you. Um, something else, Rioni. Um, over the last few years during the pandemic and especially the lockdown, we witnessed a massive shift to more contactless, and of course, just the means to an end behind to still make it real time to do. We also saw the buy now, pay later solutions and uh, quite a wild growth of the latter. Still curious to see for how long that's going to continue. But how do you think this will evolve? Uh, will we have even more contactless in the future and perhaps a bit less pay later? Yeah, it, re two really interesting phenomena to come out of lockdown. So, like in the in-store world, um, I still think about it in that paradigm in-store and, and online. Um, it, because of this concern or perceived concern around touching the point of sale, um, contactless was the go-to product, and the industry had already been consulting on moving from the thirty-pound limit that existed before. Um, and then we turned it around in a month to 45 because it was, you know, the government and well, ev everyone was very keen to keep consumers spending. Um, and in particular, that was the ATV for um, supermarkets. So we're like, well, that makes sense to put it up to 45. And um, we saw something like 12% growth um, in value um, in that in 2020 alone. I think between 2019 and 21, um, there's like a 30% growth in use of contact. So it was one in four payments, um, all payments, not just consumer payments. So it's huge growth. Um, and then last year, um, the government decided it was it was the most popular measure that UK finance undertook during 2020, um, during the lockdown. Although there were much more important things like the mortgage holidays, but it was the, the most popular one. Um, so the government decided last year to go up to 100, um, and we dutifully complied. And you know there were some benefits for doing that, some new use cases like um, petrol pumps. Um, you know, family meals out, that kind of thing. Um, and and we're, we're continuing to see growth, so we're, we're doing... Without you know, fraud. Well, without fraud, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that was, and what was really interesting, actually, with the government mandate, this is often the position we find ourselves in, the government says do this, and we talk to our members and they say, okay, we'll do it, but we need to do these mitigating mm. actions. And actually, one of the great things that came out of that was, um, again, kind of like with banks really stepping up to the plate, as they have done with open banking to a degree, um, is putting in customer controls. So a lot of banks, Starling I think was one of them, um, allowed their customers to choose their own contactless controls. And, and you could set them at zero as well. So that was, you know, a good little innovation. Buy now, pay later is a really, again, really interesting phenomenon. So I think there was a Bain report at the end of last year, um, something like 20,000 merchants in the UK already signed up. Um, and they're predicting it will be like 10% of e-commerce by 2024. <laughs> So, um, you know, they're expecting continued growth, um, or there is expectation of continued growth. Um, and it, it's a really, really interesting on like merchant um, experience specifically. So they very much target themselves to the merchants for like key um, criteria like customer acquisition and customer retention. Mm -hmm. And because they use their platforms to then, um, you know, if you, if you go on a partner platform, you then attract um, other, um, kind of customers in, so they're actually using their brand as an acquisition tool, which is really interesting. Um, but equally, from the customer end, it has a really high net promoter score. So I think, like last year, the, the Bain report, it was like 30% for the NPL versus like 5% for credit usage, even mm -hmm. though fundamentally they're the same thing. Um, so I mean, it, it kind of at the, it's, it's sort of still at the early stages um, of growth. Um, and I think someone referred to it in the panel earlier that we're going to see some regulation on this. So um, inevitably, uh, Treasury is looking at um, extending consumer credit regulations to the NPL products. And the question there is, like, how do we do that in a way not to squash the market? But equally, there are some real concerns around over-indebtedness, especially with younger demographics. Um, and equally, it's interesting, so other players are now also doing like a buy now, pay later. Um, model, so you know the car teams are doing it, Apple's doing it. There are lots of merchant acquisitions in this area, um, so everyone's trying to get a piece of it. But it, it means lots of different things. Why not pay later? Um, and also.
so again, it's so from a merchant perspective, protections aren't that great at the moment. So Klarna has like a dispute resolution process, but that's you know again, it's decentralised. So that's one particular mm -hmm. brand doing that. Um, and how many times can you replicate that that kind of dispute process across all sorts of brands? So I think it will be really interesting to see how this market expands over the next. You know, two to three years, and what what keep in mind doing. increasing interest rates. Well, exactly. Yes, absolutely. But how long will the exactly? Yeah. Yeah. And we learned it during the opening keynote of uh, David Tom that payments are still very local. We also had some comments. All technology is there, so it should have real time and instant everywhere across the globe. I remember a virtual roundtable that I organized a few weeks ago with the global payments expert of Amazon. She um, had a different opinion or a different experience. Uh, two days ago, I moderated the panel on cross-border payments. There as well, I learned that we have all the standards, but yet everyone's interpreting them slightly different. How difficult is it to make a definition, the real-time payments, uh, account to account, API-based and instant? How easy is it to make that infrastructure available on a global scale? Yeah, good question. Um, but fully loaded. I mean, there's lots, yeah. of, there's lots of ways you can answer Can we have another panel, please? <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, David's a great guy, uh, hugely knowledgeable in this area. Um, and uh, I've actually got a, a, a chat with him happening in Marbella pretty soon. But um, the observation with real-time payments is that where Visa and MasterCard have had a single proprietary global network, which is privately owned and centrally controlled. The new real-time payment architecture is inherently domestic. Uh, so it is, um, UPI will only ever be an Indian payment system. Hex will only ever be a Brazilian payment system. The new payments platform in Australia will only ever be an Australian system. And um, that creates in itself challenges um, for interoperability and uh, at Vault, and I'm not here to give a sales pitch, but, but at Vault we are addressing that interoperability by building the network of networks that harmonizes that uh, global infrastructure to a single protocol and a single point of access. And, and that's really at the, at the heart of everything that we believe in, because our observation was when you have um, different payment systems that are all domestic, how then do you address the global opportunity that that presents? And, it is a fragmented and a disparate one. Um, and uh, there are a number of initiatives around this. So the founder of WorldPay is currently working on RTGS uh, Limited, uh, which is a very interesting thing that I'm sort of monitoring and watching. You've got um, Swift GPI, which is um, Swift's Global Payments Innovation Hub. And Swift Go these days. Swift Go, that oh, Swift more Go the SME, the new elements that they go even lower Chain. Yeah, they're running tests that see payments from Sydney to Shanghai in five seconds, from Berlin to Sao Paulo in 15 seconds. So there's a lot of innovation and there's uh, a lot of discussion around this. Um, but addressing real-time payments in the domestic scenario and then how you address global real-time, I think, are two different uh, steps in the process. I think. Um, I mentioned there are 58 countries around the world from rolling out there, or at various stages of you know, conceptualizing and rolling out their, their real-time payments architecture. Some are more advanced than others, and you know, some are in implementation, others are, are working towards that implementation. Um, and so I think on a country-by-country -country basis or a region-by-region -region basis, real-time payments are being addressed. How you then connect you know, the new payments platform in Australia with open banking in Europe, UPI in India with PIX in Brazil, in a real-time fashion, then presents its own challenges. And um, then you're only talking about execution of a credit transfer. You're not even talking about required information that's used for tax reasons or whatsoever. Exactly to right. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot to be, a lot of work to be done there. I think, um, uh, you know, one of my friends, Jan McIntosh from UK Finance, currently sits on the um, on the task force that is currently uh, exploring the merits of the digital pound. Um, and I know governments around the world are, um, are exploring the central bank digital currency. I think um, one thing that needs to be understood about fiat payment systems is 
um, here. Money is like a postcard. <laughs> it sits in the in the uh, in the central bank, and it's it's pretty old and it's pretty hard to move fast. Um, you know, a digital coin or crypto asset is a, an email. It's a digital representation of the same. Once you've got a, a digital monetary instrument that is validated and verified by regulation and by the government and rubber stamped in that sense, once you're in a digital asset, you can move it in real time. So. I don't claim to be um, an expert on any of this stuff, but my hunch is that central bank digital currencies have um, a pretty important function and role to play within five, six, seven years. I think that's when the concept of global real time uh, or global instant payments, if you like, um, comes into the frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was another discussion two days ago. My, my question there will be what's going to drive that CBDC? Is it the, the, the need to make sure that economies remain macroeconomically relevant, mm. or is it really a need for consumers? Well, I think one of the things that's uh, was going to drive it, national banks to me or, or central we, banks or consumers. Yeah. Well, when you're actually addressing real-time payments, what are you actually addressing? Um, all of the banks in Britain keep their money in the Bank of England. The money doesn't actually go anywhere. So what is open banking? What is fast payments enabling? It's enabling a messaging system and an information of exchange so that banks can move information quickly. The actual physical money, when you're moving money from NetWest to Barclays or from Barclays to uh, Nationwide, doesn't go anywhere. It's still sitting in the Bank of England because all those banks in England hold their hold the money that's sent back to um, you know, the, the, the Bank of England. Right? And those British pounds never leave the Bank of England. Um, it's just ledger movements between the different banks that are, that are regulated by that bank of England. So um, where crypto, though, plays a really interesting role is international and intercontinental value exchange. When you're moving money from central bank to central bank or bank to bank, um, that's where those crypto functions really come to their own. So do I envisage a situation where um, separate instant or you know, the new payments architecture in the UK is ever disrupted by crypto, not, not in the foreseeable future. And I don't really understand the rationale for why that would ever be needed mm. in any case, because um, the money is not physically moving. So I think the opportunity that crypto presents and that digital um, asset that, that uh, we get with a central bank digital currency looking around the next corner or two um, is that international value exchange um, between countries and continents that allows, yeah, obviously once you're on, in the digital domain, you can move information in real time. So it's, it's a very interesting parallax of different initiatives that are taking place at the moment. Um, payments, as we've understood them over the next seven years, are going to be very different over the next 15 to 20 years. I don't think we have all the answers yet, this is true. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got very smart people doing a lot of work on, on innovation and payments. It's, really never been done before. Um, and so there are challenges and speed bumps along the way. But yeah, it's an exciting time to be part of it, for sure. Yeah, thank you. One of these very smart people is Cindy Rich, who has been working for the past 15 to 20 years in payments. So I'm very keen to hear, is it something that you're investigating already within your company? Not to show my age, but it's probably about 30. Uh, but uh, I do, I, I kind of want to refer to No, no, thank you. You were so kind. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing uh, about what you said there is in terms of, uh, you know, the, the trains left the station. We, it, it was, I don't, I didn't think faster payments, to be fair, I didn't think faster payments would take off as much. And the consumer perception now is it's got to be fast. But you made the point. Uh, it's a, a faster payments is a messaging transfer, not a payments transfer. When I do fast, I'm a bank, I've got my money at the reserve account. I settle four times a day. Guess what? Bank of England doesn't work on Saturday. They don't work on Sunday. You know, settlement's coming on Monday. I gotta make sure the messaging's going, but the money actually doesn't move. You know, and, and that's been a, a kind of a fundamental challenge that we've had. We've tried, customers now have the expectation. They, they want to move forward uh, in a real-time environment. But we've got horse and carry and donkeys in the back trying to catch up. 
to trying to emulate the real-time experience for individuals. We got caught off guard, I mean the uh, UK finance helped, but we created an environment where I wish we did learn from Master, uh, MasterCard and Visa because you know, faster payments came out and did not create the infrastructure for chargeback, dispute, arbitration, resolutions. They built, I mean, it took them 70 years and they've optimized it and they have a really good system. There's a lot of bad things about it, but you've created that. We've got a faster payments where people make a payment or make a transaction within seconds. And with, as we know, and, and you've mentioned, Brianna, is the social engineering of APP fraud. There, we don't have a very good infrastructure at the banks to protect it. Yes, we got confirmation of payee. Uh, my view is that's a band-aid on a major problem because we know that even with confirmation of payee, uh, 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 APP fraud still remains the largest fraud type uh, in the UK and will remain the largest fraud type uh, in the UK. I, uh, you know, I, I had conversations with Nikki Morgan, who was, uh, you know, the Treasury Select Chair, and uh, she was, you know, and, and when we talk about APP fraud, I always like to sh share with people the fact, the sophistication of this type of fraud that's happening in this industry. And I had a conversation with her around APP fraud. She goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm actually dealing with a bank governor who got duped on APP fraud." <laughs> This is not the uneducated, the uninformed, and I'm not even saying that bank governor mm. was not informed. I have, I, I probably get attacked at least once a week. I had a call, somebody knew I lived in Islington. They spoofed my phone, so I was getting an incoming call from the Islington City Council to tell me that I'm backlog on my uh, taxes on my house and they were going to basically impound my house if I didn't make a payment while I was on the phone. I'm educated. I see it looks like a legitimate phone call. I'm in it. I, luckily, I'm in the banking industry and will not make a rat move. But what I, I'm always impressed about some of these schemes, they're amazing and what the bank's payment institutions are going to have to do to compact this is a, a greater step that I've seen in the last 30 years of payments. To get this right, to get faster payments working both on the front end for the consumers to still get their generation now experience, uh, we still have a long way to go. And to your point, 70 years ago we created MasterCard and Visa, uh, 25 years ago we created faster payments. You know, look at the US, I mean I got an American accent, but. My God, they just announced <laughs> that they're launching faster payments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, you know, we don't want to basically put the Band-Aid and sell tapes on it. And that would be my only call for the industry is, okay, we, we, we've let the, let the train leave the station, but uh, we need to clean up a lot of our messes that are in the back rooms and the, the infrastructure side to make it a little bit more seamless across the board. And lastly, to your point, um, uh, Everybody, you know, I, I'm an old timer, so I'm scared shitless of crypto. Uh, you know, even you know, I'm, I'm getting I, to my question. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but I'm really happy to see even those innovators out there like Tom Bluvo, uh at in the Monzo days, or even uh, Anne, who's certainly more um, a, a, a banker in nature, staying away from them because of the amount of fraud uh, that's going through it. I mean, the the major way you pay a ransomware. Uh, uh, is through crypto. I mean, crooks and criminals, they use this as their main source. So, banks, <laughs> you know. hearing it, is it about the huge amount, amount of fraud in crypto, or is it the inability to manage fraud? I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's probably the, the latter, because I'm actually one, when I, when I saw crypto and basically distributed ledger systems, I actually wasn't excited about crypto, but I was excited about distributed ledger because what I'd love to see happen in the industry is that payment through crypto is attached to all your digital identity in a distributed ledger that carries the payment, the settlement, and your ID all in one transaction real time. That will be transformational. And to your point, then you move from a domestic infrastructure, which can still exist in the, in the hundreds of countries that will have a domestic system, 
But if you can ride the rails of a distributed ledger along with crypto, you will um, you can solve the problems that I have concerns with now, mm -hmm. which is a fully integrated real time solution that gets the customer what they want, get the merchant and acquire the settlement that they want, and make sure from a regulatory and industry perspective, we're protecting the consumer and the business interest by uh, 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 preventing fraud and preventing crime as a result of these uh, ecosystems that have been built a little faster than what they should without the backbone uh, to protect us. Thank you. Brioni, how high is it on the agenda at UK Finance? Mm -hmm. um, pretty much at the top of it, I think, I would say, in terms of our thought leadership piece. So we're running like a CBDC um, uh, or new digital money steering group that we kind of interface with um, uh, Treasury and the Bank of England on, on that. So it's kind of like a constant dialogue or just yep. industry think about where we're going with CBDCs um, and then what does, <laughs> what does Treasury and Bank of England think about that? Um, and interesting now, so we've been looking at CBDCs, um, like interoperability, business cases, um, and now we're starting to look at like wider crypto assets. We're doing a thought leadership piece on um, new, uh, what's it called? New fungible tokens? <laughs> non fungible non -fun tokens, non -fun tokens. No, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, at least, sitting there, is going to be doing that piece of work for us. Um, so yeah, we're starting to look at those like kind of wider crypto asset pieces, and it, it's interesting what you were saying about the main um, use case being international, because although there is some crypto acceptance already happening, so Agenico already has um, crypto acceptance at POS, um, albeit not in a kind of like open banking. It's done through a QR code. It's not necessarily particularly sustainable, but it is happening. And there's lots of like on and off ramping happening all over the place, like fiat exchanges. So Stripe is doing it. They announced it recently. Um, but it's all like fairly small scale, and it, it doesn't. I think to your point, it doesn't seem like it's replacing necessarily a, a significant use case um, for customers, like either in store or online. My concern actually around crypto um, is more about the inclusion point. So um, there's already a concern around digital inclusion with some of the new. Um, I guess even things like open banking, which has been fantastic for some cohorts, but probably left others who are concerned about their data privacy slightly behind. And I think crypto would just accentuate that like even more. But in, in answer to your question, we're looking at all of this um, in great detail. And I, I think we'll be producing a huge amount of um, work on it um, during the course of this year. I think, again, you know, they're not the same, open banking and crypto, but. Um, both of them at the moment, well, they're fundamentally decentralized, aren't they? Yeah. And there's no sort of um, significant government structure. And I guess, mm. more to the point, no underpinning commerciality, like no commercial agreements. So, like, what, what you know, what really kind of shifted things, I guess, at the beginning of the, of the car payment world was um, getting a fee structure in place. And maybe that's what was missing with FPS. And that, that's what means we, we can't provide um, the kind of bespoke consumer protections on FBS at the moment because there's no commercial underpinning. PayWK just run it as a non profit scheme. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know the PSR, payment systems regulators, are looking at like, is there a way to create commerciality in this piece? Yeah. I don't know what you think about <laughs> Well, that. no, I, I, I was a big proponent when Craig was actually setting up and, he, and the way the commercial structure as a non profit. I said, don't do this. You know, Add a 20, 30 percent margin in there so that you can create. Because even a 20, 20, 30 percent margin on a faster payment uh, is still significantly lower than any Visa or Mastercard interchange. So the, he was already quids in. So don't try to be totally altruistic. Because what happened was, is you're right. Now we're now the banks are saying, well, I don't want to pay more than two p for it. But geez, I bet they would have paid three p. You know, it wasn't like a big change. But the, you're right. It, uh, I think that was my biggest frustration. And to me, it should have been a commercial exercise, and, and this was something that I uh, really lobbied for, and it was something disadvantaged to us. I, I actually feel, you know, RBS pay, uh, and NatWest, all the big players pay the exact same unit cost for their faster payment than uh, basically recognized bank does, who processes maybe 30, 30 payments a day. 
versus three million payments a day. That's not commercially uh, viable because, to be fair, RBS should be getting a better price at three million payments a day than you know another bank does twenty payments a day. But I pay the same amount of uh, unit cost as um, you know RBS, and I and I personally don't think that's fair to the RBS as they should be because I should put I should put my proportion in, and they're already putting a wide proportion there. And I just think I just think they could have um, uh, uh, created a commercial vi viable model because the thing that scared me about it, and it's come back to bite them, is the fact that we end up with APP because we don't have a viable solution in there. And you and we tried, and the government forced the issue of creating a you know a pot, a pool of money uh, for dispensation. Well, the fraudsters just sat back, and uh, my my chairman, uh, you know, a U.S. Uh, guy, basically, they did it in the U.S. You got a free pot of money. The criminals and the fraudsters going, Yahoo! Let's do more because basically there's a no lose, uh, no blame culture, and thus basically the banks are not really going to be, uh, you know, focused on it because they've got a shared problem, um, uh, and the customers basically don't really care because they're getting reimbursed, and the only people that are winning through a shared pool are the fraudsters. Um, so there's still like I, we started where uh, I end where I started. There's still a lot more work we need to do in the back end to truly solve this uh, particular uh, issue, uh, which we created, um, you know, 25 years ago, where people want real time payments now and expect it. Really interesting which directions this panel has gone through because last half hour we had questions and answers that were not prepared. For this panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to account to account based. Payments, Ian. How do you think this will evolve? Are we going to go to a hybrid solution where people have a similar experience, whether they pay online or offline in store? Yeah. How, how do you see this evolve? To, to because right now, account to account is sure. mainly e-commerce. Uh, uh, no, yeah, mainly e-commerce because yeah. people are used to paying with cards. In the store. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it will go in a few different directions. Um, we'll definitely see the richness of the standards around it enable things. One of the most exciting things in the world of account to account payments at the moment is variable recurring payments. So, you know, the open banking equivalent of direct debits, but much better. Uh, and, you know, that's not something that up until very recently has kind of entered the foray um, in this world of account to account payments in the same way. So, to your question as to where this is going to go, each time the underpinning regulation kind of unlocks a little bit more kind of opportunity for broader use case development, broader innovation and so on, then we're just starting to see you know, great innovative tech companies out there building on top of the platforms that, you know, that, uh, that unlock that. And you know, that's what we aspire to do. We aspire yeah. to just to support our customers to come up with these great ideas that the underlying regulation you know, is enabling. So I think that one in particular, variable recurring payments, is going to be uh, enormous. There's some, still some headwinds there. You know, from a regulatory perspective, for us to get the full value out of that, mm -hmm. um, but but great example of where it's going for sure. Yeah. Any input there for you, Tom? Yeah, I agree. Uh, variable recurring payments is, is going to be a game changer. Um, it's uh, it's just rearing its head at the moment. Uh, agree that there are a few bits that need to be ironed out. Um, so account to account these payments for your subscription economy. Yeah, it's. Uh, Maybe a scenario helps to, to explain that if you shop at the same supermarket with your partner every Thursday night and that supermarket is trusted, uh, you can get a single strong customer authentication uh, and a single consent under a VRP. Uh, that consent is long line. Um, so you would set up parameters uh, such as no single transaction and more than 200 pounds, no more than 10 transactions in any month, aggregate value of 2,000. So long as you're operating within those payment parameters. Um, what it means for you as a shopper is either a single quick payment experience with no, nothing more to do, um, just pay now and you're done, or indeed a merchant initiated form of pool that's still a push payment, but you wouldn't need to do anything. Um, and being an account based payment method, of course, there's no chargeback, there's no fraud. Um, and we need to be transparent about that with consumers so that they understand uh, you know, their rights uh, around that are in. Um, but uh, yeah, no, VRP is definitely going to have a significant role to play. Um, I just wanted to touch on one other thing as well. In, in Europe, they're also working on this. Eric Duclambier, um, you say his name a lot better than I do. Um, 
but um, it's pretty common knowledge uh, now. It's not official yet, but uh, the expectation is that there's going to be an announcements third week of September, uh, where SEPA instance or SEPA inst is going to be mandated on all payment service providers and banks across the union. So ubiquity of instant rails and instant payments in Europe is coming. And at the European Payments Council, they're announcing their standards for VRP across Europe in November. So, um, exciting UK times ahead. Sorry? Exciting times ahead. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a lot going on. So, yeah. so perhaps we should, should schedule the same panel next year again. <laughs> All right. Um, we have zero seconds left for this panel. Now, you can always evaluate the success of a panel session based on the focus that people have on their screens. Linked to that, I think we did a very good job here, and that's all <laughs> thanks to your <laughs> valuable input and the flexibility because half of the questions were not on my list. So uh, please give them a very warm applause. Thank you, everyone. I'm going ask uh, the next panel to come forward, please, to have your mics put on, and we'll get you all on stage in the next couple of minutes. Thank you.